Um, thanks all the for having me. Thanks Grumpy Gates for having me. Actually, I was pulled into this. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I'm going to talk about debugging with Git. Um, so Git is not just a conventional um, source control system, right? It's a very pow powerful tool. It has pretty much everything that you need um, to control your code base, and you can control your source tree. And debugging is kind of like a side effect of it, but it's a powerful tool for debugging as well. Um, so this is kind of like a beginner to intermediate talk. So if, if you're already familiar with all the concepts here, um, just bear with it. I think some people will, will benefit quite a bit from it as well. So the first talk, uh, the first part of the talk is going to be about the prerequisites. Before you can actually use Git for debugging, you have to satisfy some sort of requirements first. Because um, and the biggest requirement, the first requirement, is that you have to have small and modular commits. I'm sure if you've been working in a team, probably you get your ass kicked about this a lot. Um, and I'm going to kick your ass again. If you're not doing this, please do it. The reason is that you have to walk through the Git history in order to know what's going wrong in your code base. If there's a bug, is there a defect, for example, you have to walk through the Git history and, and understand why that happens. So if your commit is not small and modular enough to be read and understood, then that's impossible. So, um, and the second requirement is your commit message has to be descriptive and don't be like myself three years ago and do something like this. It's pretty embarrassing and stupid. When you, when you look through your git message, you should probably have a good idea of what a commit does. Um, if, you, if you have to use the word end in your commit, then you should think again. Things like cleanup and refactoring um, probably are not very suitable for a small modular commit. You should break it down to two commits, one for cleanup and one for refactoring. And even better, you should break, break, out, break down into cleanup something, cleanup like a user model, for example, um, cleanup one file, or refactoring one file. Um, and why do you have, oh, sorry. Okay, um, so when you have a big change, right? Um, I, I think a lot of you go through this problem a lot. When you're developing and you forget to commit often, the best way is, is still always commit. When you do something and then it, it works and then commit it. But you can and you forget to, um, to do it. And then you have a big chunk of code to be uh, checked in. Then you can use the dash p option when you're doing a git add. Does everyone know about this? No? Oh, great. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, if you provide a dash p option when you add a file or it, or adding a folder, for example, it will show you all the chunks, um, all the code pieces. Then you can pick um, which one you want to go into commit. So doing it that way, you can break down a small chunk of changes into smaller commits. And yeah, um, the reason why you need that is think about Git history as some sort of event system. Um, each commit is like a, re a record of something that has been changed in your code base. And if you put a lot of changes into one commit, and you lose a record of all the changes um, inside. Um, <coughs> so this is going to come back again when I do a live demo, when I show you some techniques where you can go um, when it comes to debugging. So let's, let's get to that now. Oh, and um, all, almost all changes in your code base should be recorded, um, again, using small modular commits. So uh, debugging with Git. Basically, the main philosophy is that you have a system, you have uh, an application, for example, and things were working fine yesterday or some day ago um, in the past, but now it doesn't. So some features just got broken. Um, someone stupid just come in and, and check in some bad code and breaks everything that you've been working on. So debugging with Git will be able to help you resolve that problem. Um, so we're going to go through some scenarios and we'll do some live demo. Hopefully they'll work. Um, yeah, so, so the first scenario is that you have a defect or a bug. And if you're the one working on, on the code related to that bug, you probably will know what file, which file contains the issue. So 
If you know the file, then you can use either git blame or git log um, to go through what all, all the changes have been done to the file. So I'm going to show you um, an example right now. I'm not sure if this. Yeah. Uh, just clear that up. Okay, I have a project here that I've been working on, or I used to work on in the past. Um, and yeah, um, it's basically a Ruby gem. And this project is incubated by Ruby on Rails organization. And if you're a Rails developer, any Rails developers here? Oh, wow. So I worked on this in the past, but I haven't um, been working with it for a long time. And I just checked it out the other day and I saw something different.
um, suspicious commit and if I do that again hopefully it's the one I'm looking for so there you go I have my, my white border so it's, it's, it's a pretty useful tool and now since the change is very small I can, I can really look through this and understand what happens whether it's in intentional or not and probably hopefully I can get my white border back um, so if, if you are the one working on the file and you know which, which file contains the issue, you can go with git blame and git log. They're very powerful tools. Um, but oftentimes you don't know that, right? If you're new to the, to the project or you're fixing some bugs that someone else, right? Yes? I'm so new to git, uh, well, I can close the Yep. Uh, can I run two git? Uh, folders uh, or git, uh, to git archives on the same folder. Sorry, can you repeat that? Can I have two git histories? Two git history folder? for the same folder. I don't think you can. So I, I'm thinking to run one every minute that does a commit uh -huh. and I'm doing a separate, totally separate that I do manually. Um, you should use branches for that. Um, are you familiar with git branch? Um, I only see they show up when I make some changes to some projects on GitHub. Yeah, so... Um, I don't know how to explain this. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll maybe maybe we can yeah. talk after this. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so the second scenario is that if you're not the one working on the file and you don't know which file is the one your, your, you should be modifying, um, and seriously, you have no idea. So you can use git bisect. It's a very powerful tool as well. What it does is that you run a binary research process um, similar to this. So you know that the current commit is bad. And then some time ago, you can go through the history and see that there's a commit that's, that's good. So like the commit I just checked out earlier is, is a good commit. And I can mark it as bad. Um, sorry, I can mark the current head as bad and the, in that commit as good. And git bisect will walk me through the binary search process. You go to this commit in the middle, and then I can test and see if it's a good one or a bad one. And then you continue going like, like that, you go to the middle, and then it's bad, and then go to here, and it's good, and then this is the one I'm looking for. So it is pretty powerful, and I want to show you right now.
Yeah. yeah. So uh, is this commit based on branch or is it on file? The commit that you were is on my branch. On the branch? So yeah. So during this process, we don't really know what file it's targeting. It's just that commit you're targeting, right? Yeah. So you look, what you're looking for is a commit, right? And then if you do git show or commit, then you see all the things that um, the commit does. So basically, it's touching this web console HTML file. Yeah, these these are the things that have been um, added and, and removed. But one commit can have more than one file also, right? Sorry. One commit can have more than one file also. Yes. So that that's why I was saying that if you really want to do debugging e uh, easily, then you should have very very small commit. And more, if, if there are more than one files changed and you don't have a really good reason for it, then probably you should break it down. So you would commit per file? I would personally do that, but oh, okay. um, if, if you don't want to, if multiple changes in multiple files um, correspond to the same feature that you're committing, then it's fine. But I highly encourage you to do that. Okay, because so if you want to group multiple commits together, you can do it with pull requests. Right. But a commit should be atomic. Sure. But, but very often, your, your, the single commit, if you do it by, on the file level, it may not work or it may only fix part of what you're trying to do. Yeah, you can use stubs for that. So if you are adding a new file and it doesn't do anything, if, you, if it has the function call, right, you can just return something. And then it, it works, it definitely works. It will run and it uh, doesn't break anything. Okay. And then you can start adding more stuff to it. It's, it's more like a process thing than uh, a technical thing. And you just have to be disciplined to it. Um, I lost what I'm doing. Oh, automation, yes. <laughs> so this is on the assumption that we are debugging on the branch where we have made all the commits. So let's say I have a branch, I have made commits yes. uh, to that branch. Yes. And then I integrate to the next level, right? Uh -huh. All that history would be gone. What do you mean by the next level? Okay, maybe I'm not very well, very well with the git thing. Uh -huh. But master, let's say master. Yes. I have my own branch. Yes. I do the commits. Yes. I have 40 commits. And then I integrate back to master. Yes. That, that, that will go as one commit, right? It will no. be treated as a merge commit. 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40 commits. 40 commits. And then I can debug master in the same manner? Yes. Okay. Yes. Unless you squash them, that's the thing. Yeah, if you squash them, then it's just one then, commit. Then that goes, right? Then you yeah. lose this. Yeah. Okay, automation. Um, Git Bicec is pretty sweet as well. That you don't have to do all of that manual step um, yourself. You can just run a you can just write a test script and then do a git bisect run with a test script. And if the test script returns with a status code of zero, which means that the um, commit you're testing is good. So it can automate all of the Rails um, start server and then go to the browser and check for the white border easily by writing a test script. And I can just go and grab a coffee and, and go back and then you find it for me. It's pretty sweet. Um, yeah. But this, the third scenario is very, very complicated. Is that if you go through a git bisect, a git bisect process and you find one particular commit that causes the problem. But when you look at the commit, you have no idea what it does. Um, it, it makes changes to a file that you don't understand. You don't know the code that it tries to change um, why it was created in the first place. So in, in that case, you have to walk through the entire Git history and make a snapshot of the history, uh, of the Git history that is related to the problem that you are trying to debug. Um, it, it's, it's, you have to do this in a manual process, but um, I can show you it's fairly easily done as well. Um, so let me go back to master. Master is very far ahead from the branch that was um, demoing with you. So now all of the, um, the, the code structure has been changed a lot. There's no act action dispatch folder. Everything is inside a web console folder. And inside that folder, we have we have um, templates, and inside templates, we have uh, multiple 
template files. There's not just one file anymore. And we have this style of CSS.erb. Um, this is the one that contains all the CSS files in master. And if you do a git log of that file, it's only one commit. What does this mean? If this is the, the one causing the problem, and there's just one commit, you can't do anything. Um, this means that this file is either brand new or it's broken down from another file. And in order to verify that, you just have to look at what the commit does. And um, there's a huge chunk of thinking here, which is why I said if you have really, really small commits, that's a lot easier to go through which com each individual commit and, and know what it does. Um, I can just search for my, my file, the file that I was looking for. Uh, yeah, so this file is basically renamed from, um, yeah, so this is the one deleted and this is the one added. So style.css.erb was renamed to, um, what, is it, what is the other way around? It, yeah, um, style.css is renamed to style.css.erb. Um, so if I want to know what happened to this style of CSS, I can just check out the commit that happened before that, which is the commit that creates the style of CSS file. And then I can still have, I have the style of CSS, and I just do a git log again. <coughs> but again, you have only four commits here. It's still not enough. I want more information, because I want to find out why this code is added in the first place, so if it, is, if it is a problem and I haven't worked on a code, um, I'm not the one writing it, then I need a lot of information in order to understand what it does and why it doesn't behave the way I want it to. So um, the same thing, you can just get check out this commit and go back to the commit after that, uh, before that, which is the commit that um, before creating or renaming a file, and you check that again, style.css.erb. So style.css.erb was renamed to style.css and is renamed to style.css.erb again. <laughs> so if this thing continues, right, then if you just do a git bisect and you get the very first commit that's bad, you have no idea what goes on. Um, you need to understand why this crazy behavior happens. Um, probably some programmer thinks of some brilliant idea and then um, it doesn't work out. Um, it's not the case here, but um, yeah. So if you log the file again, that's again. It's only one commit. It's still not enough. You remember when when I did the yes? What if you commit every minute with a timestamp? <laughs> You will be able to read everything. You'll be able to read everything, but your commit will not probably not make sense. Yeah. Because your commit needs to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> you have um, some changes that something like add a new file or delete a fi some file, and it doesn't contribute anything. Um, and the commit message is important too. If you read, this is a very good commit message, right? It says extract something or something. Um, which probably means that there's a file that's been broken down into smaller files. And then, yeah, this template file is just getting quite big and blah, 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 so I need to break it down further. So which, this is a very, very descriptive um, description. It helps you understand what the commit does, even though the commit is, is rather big. Um, <coughs> so if you commit every minute, you lose that very descriptive message. I usually have a descriptive message on top of each function. Top of each function. Yeah, but the message is for the change. Yeah. That's why you're making a change. Yeah, why you're making a change. It's not time machine. It's more like a sort of fixed pattern. Yeah, other than I'm looking at this, because if you're going to make a very huge editorial responsibility of these commits, mm -hmm. you will spend a lot more time than just putting in a time step and reading step by step backwards. Well, it's, it's a good investment. Think about it. Think, think of it as an investment, right? If you have a timestamp, you have a lot of commits that don't really make sense. When you go back to the commit um, to tra time traveling, then you won't be able to understand what they do. This is documenting your... Yeah, basically documenting. Process. 
it's like in your life, right? In some stage of your life, something happened and you want to make sense of it. Like you get married, why you get married or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so <coughs> it's the same process over and over again until I can. So you can see here now. If I go back to one commit earlier, then we have this session not HTML or ERB file, which is the only file that's under template. And remember the commit message earlier: extract template rendering and split into temp into template files. So this is a big file that we are talking about. Um, now, if if I go and git log the file and it should show me some changes to it, and if if this is the um, this, if this provides enough information for me to start debugging, then I'll just stop here. But you can go on and on, keep walking through the Git history, until you find, probably until um, the beginning of time when something was introduced, some feature was introduced, and then you have all the information that you need. Um, you understand about the system, you understand about the problem, and you can start debugging with that. So I'm gonna stop here, but you can actually go further and then go to the um, underscore web console, the HTML or ERB file that we were showing you earlier. So some food for thoughts actually. Um, my live demo is done. You don't have to see that again. Uh, can all of this be, all, be automated? It actually can be, right? Git bicep can be automated using a test script, as I mentioned earlier. And the whole process of walking through the Git history also can be automated. The problem is that your commit is not, um, is not good enough for, for you to write any script that passes the commit and do something with it. Like walking through the, the Git history. It's, it's basically the same process. You go Git log and then get the first commit that changes in the file, and then check out the commit before and then go through it again. Um, so if you can classify the commits, into different categories. Git basically acts on files, right? And there are only a few things you can do with files. Either you're adding a new file, or deleting a file, or breaking, it down, breaking down a file into multiple smaller files, as I showed you earlier, or you're making changes to the file. And, and it's just that. Each commit should do um, one of the four things, and nothing more than that. Um, this is a little bit out of control because as a developer you can't be disciplined enough to do something like that. So I'm thinking about something, um, some sort of a abstraction layer on top of Git that enforces this kind of behavior. But it's just some food for thoughts, um, seriously. But the same is the, my philosophy in theory that this whole thing can be automated very well. And then think about, imagine the future, right? If you if your user reports something. Uh, wrong with the system, something, some new bugs were introduced, and then just run like a single command, gives you all of the information that you need um, through the Git history, and then you can have all everything you need to start debugging and start crafting up a solution. Um, it's it's pretty powerful. So Git is awesome. Um, use it. If you're not very good at it yet, just keep working with it until you're better. I think. Um, yeah, that's it. Yes. Hi, I've got a quick question about renaming files. It sounds like from what you say that the moment you do a git mv, you should commit Yes. before you work on the rename file. Renaming file, basically, to git, it means you're deleting a file and then you um, create creating a new file. And then there's some reference yeah. to that as well. Exactly. Um, yeah, so if you rename a file, then probably you should commit. Immediately. Immediately. Before, before you work, before you work on something else. I think you should change the references also to this file before you commit to or not? No, Git will do that automatically for you. So to Git, basically, you're adding a new file and you're deleting a new, um, an existing file. Yeah. But if you commit right away, right, and you look through the commit message in the future, and then you know that you're, um, you're basically just renaming a file. 
And you shouldn't mix your changes into that as well. Yeah, I think that, that's my mistake. I've gotten in a lot of trouble for that. Yeah. 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 <coughs> the long history of files when you rename. The long history of files when you It's probably very hard. It's very, very hard. Um, so what, what I did, right, it, as you can see earlier, History when it's renamed. So this file is actually renamed from a style CSS file, and you can do a git log dash dash, which means it will um, provide the logs of, of uh, all the commits that happen to the file which has been renamed. This is the one that uh, that appeared in the past and doesn't appear now, and you can still do that with git. But the problem is in this scenario, right? You have a file fi file A has been renamed to file B, but then you rename back again to file A. And then it's impossible to just look through all the changes. And you have to walk through the git history, go back to the commit before when, it's, when the file is renamed, and then you can um, log it and see the commits before that. Does the follow option work? Follow option? So git log has an option called dash follow? Let's just try that. I haven't tried that, actually. This? Yeah. yeah. It's still. Wait, let's move. If you don't have the follow option. Oh, yeah, it works actually. It's pretty good. Yeah, it works. Thank you. So basically, when you rename a file, yep. it sort of keeps track of it based on the similarity of the deleted file and the cre created file. And you can. Uh, I think in log or some other commands, you can actually tell it how much similarity you want it to keep in mind. So I don't remember the exact option, but it has it somewhere. You yeah. can do that? Yes, you can specify the similarity percentage. Or I thought it's like keeping an I node of the file or something. I don't know. I also don't. Yes. Maybe I'll say the question. Just you mentioned you know, of file A renewing to file B, then back yeah. backwards. So if this happened in the past, then is that a way for us to correct it or you know make less trouble to the for the future? Um, you have to do it yourself in the present. You cannot go back. Well, I, I encourage you not to go back and then make modification in the past because it's very nasty. You want to keep a record of all the things that have been changed in the system, and basically don't keep lies. Because if you go back and change something, it's just a lie. So yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. My colleague has this, uh, or my colleagues <laughs> has this nasty habit of uh, checking out Git. Yes. And then after that, copy it to another folder, <laughs> do changes there. Yes. Take a, a bunch of files and everything, move back to the Git directory. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> copy them as one whole change. Yes. How do I tell them not to do that? <laughs> <laughs> kick, your, kick their ass! <laughs> yes. I think those are called standard operating procedures. Let's <laughs> <laughs> kick their ass, really. <laughs> Get the free from y'all. In this whole demo, I'm sure like, there are lots of checkouts that are happening. Yes. So, in real time scenario, how it happens is the issue comes in whenever you are working on the other task, right? Yes. So, what will happen if the files uh, consider I do a checkout? Yeah. And uh, at that time, I already had some files which are made. I was editing. Yes. So, how do we solve this question? So, um, you can do either one of two things. First thing is you can stash them. Um, it basically will go to um, a place somewhere, like a heaven place. Yeah, spoiler for us. So yeah, um, the second option is that you can go to another branch and commit all the changes there, just a dummy commit, it's just like a placeholder, and then go back to the current branch and you can check out um, in the past easily. Sorry? No, just go to a temporary branch. Yeah, a disposable one. Yeah. Is that a possible way to 
Uh, yes, you can. Um, Git rebase can do that as well. So yeah. probably Jason will talk about it too. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you.